All right, it's now 15 past, so we should get started. Welcome everyone to the final session in track three of, of Kai Nordic today. This one's on writing and tracking. We have three interesting papers to come. And to start, I'll just remind everyone that after each presentation, you can ask questions from the authors in the chat. And if you want also, please turn your videos on so we'll get more engagement. And we'll jump right into it. Oh yeah, my name is Juho Backman and nice to see everyone here. Um, to get started, we, our first paper is called Collaborative Writing Across Multiple Artifact Ecologies by Ida Larsen Ledet, Henrik Korsgaard and Susanne Böttger. And please, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes. All right, can I just get started? Hello, everyone. Yes. My name is Ida Larsen Lid, and I'm from Aarhus University in Denmark. I'm presenting the paper Collaborative Writing Across Multiple Artifact Ecologies, which is joint work with Henrik Kosko and Susanne Bilger, who are also both from Aarhus University. More precisely, what we've studied is academic collaborative writing taking place in universities. Academic collaborative writing has been studied from a number of angles, and some of the things we already know about it, both by personal experience and from research, is that negotiating the tools is a significant part of the work that goes into collaborative writing, since the tools in use can have a great impact on the writing process. We also know that planning and coordination are challenging aspects of the ongoing writing process. Communication plays a large role in this, but also just in addressing and discussing the text itself. Recent research, including ours, has also been studying how co-writers manage parts of the writing process being shared, while others are not shared. Some of the previous research has noted the inclusion of multiple tools in academics' writing processes. What our study contributes is an examination of how writing through and across multiple tools or applications takes place. In our paper, we identify patterns of multi-application collaboration and motivations for transitioning between applications. We also extend previous taxonomies on collaborative writing with a categorization of the role of the text itself in the writing. Based on this, we discuss some challenges to the collaborative writing process. In this talk, I will focus on characterizing co-writers' motivations for transitioning between applications. And then I encourage you to have a look at our other findings in the paper. For this project, we interviewed 32 academic writers about particular recent writing projects they had been part of. The interviewees were master's students or researchers at a number of universities. The interviews spanned a total of 18 projects with some overlap where a few participants had been part of multiple of the projects. The projects that participants described had lasted between one week and two and a half years. We also conducted follow-up interviews with 14 participants. We asked participants about both practical and social aspects of the collaborations, such as strategies for text production and division of work, and approaches to editing text written by co-writers. Participants used several tools in their writing, tools here used as an analogy for digital devices and applications, although the illustration in my slide shows tools in the more traditional sense. We've used the concept of artifact ecologies to frame participants' work in and across multiple tools. Now I'll briefly explain that concept and provide some examples of writing ecologies. The concept of artifact ecologies captures how people have and use sets of interactive artifacts, and how these sets or ecologies shape and are shaped by concrete practices such as collaborative writing. This is a quick hypothetical example of a personal artifact ecology. Google Docs for real-time joint editing, InDesign for layouting, an external hard drive for project data, Mendeley for reference management, and WhatsApp for quick communication. A hypothetical example of some overlapping artifact ecologies, where one co-writer in the bottom right is creating illustrations in OmniGraffle while keeping in touch with collaborators on WhatsApp. Another co-writer on the left is managing their notes on Google Drive and maintaining an overview of shared files through a cloud storage service. 
And the third co-writer in the top right is finalizing the layout in Overleaf and reading the paper reviews in Outlook. As this illustrates, the artifact ecologies that co-writers work in are a combination of the personal ecologies that they bring with them into the collaboration and the aligned ecology of tools that co-writers negotiate at the start of and throughout the work, as well as whatever tools happen to be available in certain situations. This figure illustrates overlaps between aligned and personal artifact ecologies in a simplified generic form. As we've depicted, the activities carried out by co-writers can take place both in the aligned ecology and outside of it in various constellations of personal, shared and available tools. We have identified three overall patterns for how co-writers manage the writing of a common text across these overlapping ecologies. In the collaborative home pattern, co-writers write within an online platform where text is persisted and synchronized between devices. In the handover pattern, co-writers decide on a common file format and exchange files via communication media such as email. And in the repository pattern, co-writers decide on a common service for storing and synchronizing the document between devices. These patterns take place through co-writers switching between the tools they use. We've categorized the different motivations for transitioning from one tool to another that participants described to us. We've identified four kinds of transitions. Functional transitions are motivated by a need for different, better, or more familiar features. For example, temporarily moving from Google Docs to Microsoft Word to use the spell checker. Aesthetics and user experience transitions have to do with things like comfort, distractions, and various stimuli. An example is writing in Notepad because a more drafty look can alleviate writer's block. Another example is transitioning to escape distractions, for example, in real-time collaborative editing environments where co-writers editing can make text jump up and down. Personal space transitions occur when co-writers seek solitude in order to better focus or to be in control of when others provide feedback to them. Another reason for personal space transitions is concerns about how one appears to collaborators. Finally, communication transitions can be motivated by the more or less urgent need to track down a co-writer, which can sometimes turn into a treasure hunt across collaboration tools and dedicated communication applications. Communication transitions also happen when the usual channel does not satisfy particular needs in the communication, such as persistence or transience of communication. I have a couple of concrete examples to show you before I describe some of the challenges that result from this. In this first example, a co-writer is describing how real-time collaborative editing of LaTeX documents can result in a bad user experience, since one person's edits can cause compilation errors for collaborators. This motivates him to do particularly tricky work in a separate editor. He says, for instance, making figures that always breaks things. I sometimes use this online table generator and get the table set up outside, and then I paste it into LaTeX when I know that it can compile. This is the second example where a co-writer is describing the difficulty of communicating which part of the text he would like collaborators to pay attention to while they're communicating remotely. He says, but where it gets difficult is when you need to refer directly to something in the text. Then you make a comment in Google Docs, then you go into Messenger and say, could you go and check this comment? A number of challenges result directly from co-writers need to transition between multiple applications in their ecologies. I'll outline a few of them before finishing up. First of all, moving between document types results in missing or changed formatting, layout, and structure. For example, participants describe transferring the text from a Google document into a LaTeX file and having to redo everything from text formatting to references. Knowing which version is the most up-to-date is another issue that several participants describe struggling with. This is, for instance, difficult when one co-writer is working on content in one application, while their co-writer is adding references or fixing the layout in another. Finally, participants describe losing sense of progress and of who is working on what. For example, when a co-writer has retreated to a local text editing tool in order to focus, other co-writers are unable to react and adapt their work to how the co-writer's part of the writing is progressing. To sum up, collaborative writing takes place across co-writers individual and overlapping artifact ecologies. 
They apply certain strategies or patterns for structuring the collaboration, for example, by handing files over or keeping a shared repository. Accomplishing this involves many transitions between the tools and co-writers' ecologies with a number of different motivations. And while this helps co-writers accomplish their work, it also presents them with a number of challenges that affect their experience of the writing process and what they need to spend their time on during writing. This includes both practical aspects such as transferring formatting and structure and more coordinative aspects of the work. As I mentioned, this was only a partial presentation of our findings and I encourage you to have a look at our paper to learn more about the role played by the text itself in the writing. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, let's give a round, round of applause for our presenter. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. <laughs> uh, okay, now it's time for you to post questions. You can do so in the chat and uh, please post them there and I will then invite you to ask the questions aloud to the speaker. Should I just respond from right. the chat? Well, I, oh, I, maybe I should read it out loud. Okay, I was unmuted. Yeah. I didn't notice. Hi, Ida. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> just wanted to ask, have you thought about what we can do to better support these transitions um, that you mentioned and avoid some of the, the breakdowns in future tools? Uh, yeah, I mean, so part of the paper is not, there's not a solution in the paper, but we do discuss approaches on how to do this as well in there. Um, but it's it seems to be a, bigger thing than just making a neat tool that helps. Um, I mean, I did see your presentation earlier, actually, where there are some nice ideas about how to sort of move it beyond just having it on a screen, which is actually also part of the problem and why people feel the need to, for example, work in a in a space that's separate and that makes them have to work back and forth. Well, you had some some nice thoughts about using proxemics for, um, for a more sort of nuanced management of how present you want to be or what you want to share. Um, but other than that, there one option that we discuss is moving to a completely different paradigm where things are document or activity centric instead of having to move between applications to have different features. So it it might be a lot to ask from industry right now, but uh, we are trying to a bit push for uh, maybe actually looking at different kinds of uh, application paradigms. Right, anything else? Okay, Mary Arriopi has a question, please go on. Mm, thank you. Thank you for the very relevant presentation. It's probably recognizable for many for us, many of us. Um, and I was wondering if, um, if you looked into how the co-authors actually solve these problems or these issues like collaboratively, how, how do they navigate in this way of transitioning between different platforms? And if that brought some insights to you that could be applicable? It did. I mean, I guess we, we mostly focused on how it's a problem. That sounds really negative. But, but of course, there are also ways to look at how people manage it now and if that's a viable way to do it or maybe a way to support it. Uh, for example, people have really intricate strategies for version management. So actually, when they share something in, a, in the repository strategy, when they upload something online and someone else is supposed to download it and work on it, people have developed all sorts of strategies for how to know which version is the one we're in now or which version has the, the most up-to-date introduction, whereas another one has the up-to-date illustrations, for example. So there are, people do have strategies for this and it is something we, we looked into. Um, don't know if it's a bit much to get into which ones. Uh, but I wanted, one way is just the way of naming the files where right now they would have to to write their name and the date in it for when they opened it and then they would write finished so other people could know that now they're allowed to open the document and there won't be weird overriding conflicts and of course a simple way to solve that would just be to allow people to tag something as I'm using it or mm -hmm. I'm not with it now. Um, that, that could be an example, yeah. Interesting. I don't know if you want to hear more about it. I can say a bunch, but, but I, I guess I can read it also from the paper. But that's yeah. Uh, thank you. Otherwise, please email me. I'd be happy to answer. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Uh, if there's no more questions, then maybe I can ask one uh, in this place. I was wondering, you say that, that you study academic writing uh, and, and my, my field is in science studies. So I'm of course interested in this. And I was wondering whether you could say a bit more about uh, about the academic backgrounds of your participants, because I was I also also had a look at your paper and, and I was thinking that maybe maybe the field of the participants has an influence on how they use collaborative writing tools. So what was the background here and could you say something more about like whether yeah. this would vary? I, I think it would vary. I agree very much. Um, and I'm kind of glad you asked because this was mostly the, the people we had in this were well computer science designers, like very typical HCI study participants, um, most of them. And I mean, they had different backgrounds, but it was still then the most remote might have been someone who came from mathematics. Um, for example, I had troubles actually recruiting from the physics department because they have a very different way of working together, at least the physics, the person I know who's from a physics department, because their structure of collaboration is that some people conduct the experiments, some other people do other experiments that follow them up, and then someone else writes it. So they had a hard time sort of collecting and finding out who I actually wanted to talk to. Um, and another thing is that different fields use the author order in a different way, which actually sometimes played into how people talked about. Um, so part of the reason for maybe transferring out is that you feel ownership of a certain part of the text and you want that to yourself until it's ready because you don't want someone who's not as into it to come and, and mess it up for you. Um, but some, some people that I've talked to, unfortunately not in the interviews, have a different conception of this, which I suspect has something to do with them not putting an author first that is sort of the main author of the paper. They just have an author list that no one can see who's first. So they thought it was strange to sort of own part of the paper, at least this one person I have an anecdote from. Um, so I do definitely think, and I, in a later study, I've tried to recruit more broadly and see if I could get people from other kinds of fields. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to write, write and say more about that later as well. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Okay, um, anything else? I, I have more questions if, if there's <laughs> none from you, but there's a bunch of you, so so go ahead if you have any. All right, maybe, maybe I'll just ask another one here. So um, I was wondering, uh, at least in the paper, uh, you said that 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 some of the projects that you were studying spanned over a long time, and that this this was a, like a, a feature in your analysis. I was wondering whether you could say a bit more about that because I I'm not sure whether I I I got it out of the analysis. Like how how like for instance, if you do this over a two two years period, then then how does this influence the like use of collab collaborative tools? Well. It's also hard to say something general because again, it was only 18 projects, but one thing is that they have to, it seems they have to manage it in a different way. So two of the, the very long-term ones were both books uh, and it's a very different sort of thing to write with. And there was a lot of backtracking as well because you might sit with a chapter and remember something you, oh, this would actually be useful, but it's been a year and a half since you actually removed that from the chapter and you have to go back and sort of suddenly saving version, versions was a really big part of it. So one book was written on using GitHub so they could actually just go back through it and didn't talk that much about it. But the people who had used Microsoft Word and email, they had this whole giant backlog of versions of the chapters. And that's, for example, one way where it seems that people in general tend to want to save everything they do. And when they change something, they want to save the old version. But they actually used it for communication in the very long projects, whereas it seems like they're actually just forgotten and left behind in shorter term projects. That's one example of where it makes a difference. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. All right, we're, I think we're having a afternoon effect here <laughs> that's fine yeah uh there's still one minute to go um i can ask you a difficult question about common objects that's that's the concept that you use i was wondering how does this relate to 
the notion of boundary objects, if you're familiar with that one. Is it, is it the same thing, really, uh, that, that there's an object which people understand in a different manner and this, this somehow enables them to co-author it? Or... I mean, I'm, I think common, the common objects we talk about can be boundary objects, but I think it's not the same thing because the, as I understand the concept of boundary objects, it's, it relates a lot to communication and sort of acting out your work and understanding also other kinds of work than your own. And when we're talking about common objects in the paper, we're more thinking about having something that you work on that you think sort of that that's the thing you're trying to create and that you might be trying to align on. And sometimes you think you're aligned and you're not. So it's not, you, you can actually say that they play different roles. So when you're talking about the boundary object, it's in the communication. You might, you might at the same time see the text as the common object that you're producing, but also as a boundary object and that mediates the work. But I think it's sort of a different framing of the role of the object, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. A one minute Thanks. explanation. Yeah, that's 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 a good way to put it in one minute. Thanks. Okay, uh, that let's give another round of applause to Ida and her co-authors. Thank Thanks you. very much for the presentation. Thanks and for um, questions. next up, we have um, a paper called "Crafting of Personal Information: Resistance, Imperfection, and Self-Creation in Bullet Journaling" by Jakob Tholander and Maria Nurmark. So. Whenever you're ready, please go on. Okay, I think we're not getting the audio. So uh, when you when you start sharing, please make sure to click the the share computer audio button. Or is it? Uh, how about now? Hello, my name is Jakob Tulander. Yes. Thanks. Working. Good. I hope to present this paper that I wrote together with Maria Nomark from Södertörn University. I'm from Stockholm University. Uh, the paper title is Crafting Personal Information and Resistance, Imperfection and Self-Creation in Bullet Journaling. Um, so bullet journaling uh, is a practice where you to create handwritten combinations of a calendar, to-do list, habit tracker, and journal. Uh, and it's designed to organize your personal information. Uh, and it can look in many different ways, like you see on the pictures here. So bullet journaling is a practice in which craft-based skills are mixed with the managing of personal information. Uh, and by providing opportunities to engage with personal information in a fashion that revolves around personal crafting, continuously tweak to individual needs and desires. Bullet journaling represents a highly personal approach to managing personal information. And, and we conducted a study where we try to understand the potentials of this practice for interaction design. Uh, and we investigated the lived experiences, strategies and practices uh, that bullet journalists engage in when managing their everyday information how information is made relevant and the roles it plays in the, the practitioner's lives. Uh, so research-wise, this relates to a number of contexts which are uh, relevant to interaction design and human-computer interaction. Uh, most obviously, it uh, connects to ways of dealing with everyday personal information, uh, like personal informatics and other kinds of personal data practices. Uh, it also relates to the uh, ways of doing hand-based crafting of personal information, working with analog materials, uh, letting them be imperfect and incomplete, not being, per not being finished in a sense. And it also relates to studies around discourses of productivity and self-improvement. So we did an uh, ethnographic study where we did two kinds of data collection. We studied uh, Facebook uh, communities online where people discuss uh, their 
and, and engage in, in bullet journaling. And we also conduct a number of in-depth interviews with uh, people engaging in bullet journaling. We did uh, thematic analysis uh, and lots of reflective note-taking on this data. So in our findings, we have four main themes uh, that we would like to highlight a little bit of today. Uh, firstly, how crafting of personal information in this fashion and design of information structures engages in deliberate and strategic boundary work or what kinds of information to include and exclude in their lives uh, and in their journals, of course. And secondly, how crafting of personal information engages in deliberate self-creation and reflection on the personal trajectories uh, that these users want to pursue. And thirdly, how open-ended use of various forms of materials for crafting of personal information allows for an appreciation of ourselves and the world around us as imperfect and in the making. And fourth, how this practice engages in ways of resisting uh, the very business-like efficiency that comes with the large quantities of personal information that, uh, that permeate many aspects of contemporary life. Uh, so the first theme is about the kinds of information work that participants engaged in. And uh, a typical quote that, we, that our uh, participants uh, did, came with was that uh, they said things like, I want the journal to be personal. I don't want a lot of routines about cleaning. I think, I think that stuff belongs to the whole family. It's my own stuff that interests me. And further, uh, this person also said that it should be pleasurable, like books I want to read, film or series on Netflix. Uh, this, gives, this gives me a list I can go back to and check out on. Uh, so there are two things that participants Instead, they engage in what we call informational boundary work. They crafted information to, uh, by, uh, in a way, defining personal boundaries uh, uh, with help of the information. And they uh, also try to take control over their personal life trajectories through something that we call information selection work. Uh, and this particular form of crafting of personal information uh, was a process that gave meaning to the participants' journal in fundamental ways. Crafting information involved a simultaneous process of reflection and learning and to ascribe, ascribe meaning to information. Its design improvements and corrections were integral parts of the process and an appreciation of the imperfectness of building these journals. Uh, this is typically illustrated by this quote by one of our participants. Now, I still have to do this planning. To me, it becomes a shortcut for those of us who are not as crafty. The drawing effect, I fight against perfectionism. You let it be ugly, skewed, they're false, and you have to live with them. So in a, fact, in a way, bullet journaling is a way to resist various things in lives. Uh, typically, one of our participants said things like, there's something about the digital world that triggers stress more. Uh, this is more relaxing. Possibly it has to do with the neighbors that call for attention, like social media, time thieves. So the practice of keeping information in analog form avoids getting entangled up with other digital sources of information in undecided ways, staying away from what this participant called attention-seeking social media neighbors. Uh, and the openness of bullet journaling allows for possibilities of exploring and expressing oneself in ways that could be argued as liberating, becoming response to societal demands. So to start concluding, uh, bullet journaling as a form of data practice created a subjective framing to the interpre interpretation of information for our participants. And this articulation of 
deliberate strategies for the boundaries for inclusion and inclusion of information and in what form became a way for the participants to reflect over where to draw the lines between themselves, their families and other important relations in their lives. So a bullet journal is constantly in the making and as such incomplete, preliminary and imperfect, promoting an inherent form of change to the practice of bullet journaling and consequently to the narratives that people created about themselves. Uh, so as a final remark, uh, we would like to bring up how bullet journals are packed with subjectivity and personal dimensions, creating intimate ties between people, their information and its, ex its expression. So interaction with personal information became a continuous process of design and reflection rather than mere interaction and ma manipulation of predefined information structures. Engaging with personal information in this fashion would make the interaction valuable and personally engaging beyond the rationalistic and instrumental purposes that govern much technology, much current technology development. So rethinking technologies for generating, storing and managing of, of personal information in this fashion may contribute to reshaping users ways of negotiating its meaning and to make room for establishing alternative narratives about themselves and their lives. So thank you. Uh, I hope this was about 10 minutes. We'll see when I click end here. Thank you. Let's thank upload you. to Jakob Tollender and, uh, and Maria Nurmark. Thanks for the presentation. And now it's again time for questions. Please post them in the chat. All right. Uh, so Barry Brown has a question. Go ahead, Barry. Hi, hi, Jacob. Um, I just wanted to ask, did you have any feelings about the impact of the bullet uh, journaling on the well-being of those who were who were doing the journaling? Did they did they talk about using it explicitly for that reason, or was it something they remarked upon? Yeah, they actually. Uh, several of them actually explicitly talked about them how this was for like their like uh, psychological and mental well-being and how this uh, how this uh, in many ways helped them to create kind of strategies and ways of of, of dealing with information and consequently with activities and so on in their life so that they uh, in a way that helped them to like this other participant said like that I had this quote from uh stay away from all these kind of attention seeking neighbors or stuff to in a sense organize their lives better and then kind of focus on the things they wanted to focus on uh, and not be yeah. i mean this the guy who invented it talked about it as a stress the stress management tool and um and i think some of the uh the participants actually used it in that particular fashion while some used it also in a very instrumental fashion to really to organize work or to organize home and so on. So, uh, but they definitely talked about well-being, both psychological and also physical well-being. All right, uh, maybe I'll ask a question at this point. Um, I was wondering, um, your study was on Facebook communities, right? Uh, so I was wondering, wh like what, what kind of a phenomenon is this outside of Facebook? Is, is, like, uh, uh, is, is this a mainly, mainly social media driven thing or? No, I, I should say that this is uh, mm -hmm. our, our study was both on Facebook and uh, I mean uh, regular uh, in-depth interviews that was not online. Uh, so the, the participants that we engaged with were 
uh, or that we we met i mean we met them we recruited them through facebook but i mean primarily we did not interview them about their use of this as an online uh, as an online thing uh, and i mean the facebook communities are one important way for them to meet but there are also i mean there are stores now or like uh, lots of stores have bullet journaling uh, papers and pens and so on in them in this and there are also like events for bullet journalists and so on like conferences and stuff so so it's it's bo i mean it's just as much a, a phenomenon of the of mm -hmm. of the faith communities as in uh, in like in real life so to speak um, All right Uh, but but I should also say there that the the participants that we interviewed, they were not, I mean, their engagement with this was not particularly around around being engaged online. They used it for their very personal reasons, uh, rather than engaging with with others uh, mm -hmm. over Facebook on this. Yeah, because I I'm just I'll have a follow up on this because I was just wondering whether it's like. Um, uh, whether whether this is uh, an active community of people doing this or or like because it it started from from one guy doing this and then has spread yeah. so 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 uh, I I was wondering about about like whether this exists actually outside of of uh, social media but but apparently it does so yeah it definitely does and there I mean there are many different kinds of Facebook groups some some are for kind of mental health and some are for mm. uh, for it's merely about how you kind of how you craft your uh, your books and, and so on so there are lots of different kinds of communities and we we started a, a number of different of them but we had a different character each of them yeah thanks all right anyone okay Meri Ryöppy has a question, and then Minna Saariketo has a question, but Meri, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, so we're going to present in, in a minute um, with the more, also we found some more collaborative aspects on, on um, how people share and navigate data. So I was wondering if there were any collaborative aspects that um, you found on, on crafting this information on those bullet journals or was it all so personal that um, um, people well, I mean there, there are lots of uh, lots of collaboration particularly around around how you craft your information structures and how you design certain things and so on so uh, so someone would say I'm interested in these kind of trackers because I'm a, for some maybe for is for their uh, for their running or whatever it is. Then they would share that online and and mm. get help on how to. Uh, so there are lots of lots of collaboration on how to on the kind of design and craft aspects of this. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, but then there are all the participants that we that we interviewed were very keen on keeping the informational aspects of it very much to themselves. So in our paper, we could not share that much of. Uh, of their of the content of their journals because they saw that as very personal. There was not anything they wanted to have in a in a research paper. Uh, but if when we go online and look at uh, in all these Facebook groups, one of the big things that is discussed is how how to design things. Uh, so there's lots of sharing and discussing on what's the best ways of of creating information structures and whatever whatever it is. And it could be also on details like what pens are the best ones, what papers to choose, and and all these other much smaller details than just about structure. Mm, mm. And well, this brings another question. Then, how how did you deal with that very personal uh, type of data? Because yeah, obviously you couldn't share all of the aspects. Did it raise some questions during the research process? How to present the data that is uh, highly personal to people? Yeah, I mean the, the first. The first thing was that they, the person that we interviewed, they would not allow us to take pictures, or only a few of them allowed us to take pictures of their journals and so on. Mm. Uh, and and even though they were very kind of open in what they what they talked about, they were also very kind of, uh, or 
we we tried to all the time we were clear that this would not be used for i mean we would avoid any any personal stuff getting out in, in the research so that was definitely something we, we had to consider uh, all the time throughout our study uh, and in terms of so what looked on the in stuff on facebook and so on there mostly we, we studied the kind of the, the structure and the design aspect of this not so much on what they actually used it for in information or or personal wise okay Thank you. Okay, uh, Minna, we have time for a very quick question. If you want to go ahead. I wanted to ask about the role of other social media platforms for this kind of bullet journal uh, sharing or learning. So as I know in Instagram, there are loads of people sharing things. So did this come up in your interviews? Because as I understood, it was mainly Facebook community. So did they reflect the role uh, of uh, other? We, yes, it came up definitely. And there are other studies of uh, uh, where people looked at the Instagram conversations uh, about this. So uh, yes, I mean, we, we did not pay particular attention to, to, to other medias, but there are definitely those, those were important. So yes. All right, let's give another round of silent visual uploads <laughs> to our presenter. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think I can't hear oh, you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> next up we have Imagining Data Objects for Reflective Self-Tracking by Maria Carrida, Mere Ryöpy, Jacob Boer and Andres Lucero. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, is it fine? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, hi everyone, I'm Mary Carida, and today I will present to you the paper Imagining Data Objects for Reflective Self-Tracking. This paper was co-authored with Mary Aropu, Jacob Bull, and Andres Lucero. So let's begin. We live in a world singing in digital information. In this picture, you can see commercial products which can capture and present people's self-tracking data in digital forms. While all of them look alike, what makes them different is that they carry individuals' personal information. And this is actually how they become special to people. However, there are also these other kind of objects that become meaningful to people because they are connected to other people, places, and events. This is a picture taken at Alto University. A person had lost their special glass, and in that flyer, they nicely illustrate how important that object was to them. In our work, we looked into this type of objects that were meaningful to people. More specifically, we invited our participants to imagine speculative combinations between their most cherished possessions and their personal objects. But let me begin with the motivation of our study. Self-tracking allows people to engage creatively with their data from creating their own visualizations to even making their data physical. In, the, in particular, in this picture, you can see an example of such experimentation. Commonly, those explorations with data happen away from the lived experiences. To fill that gap, data objects, which are material representations of contextually relevant data, and are in the intersection of industrial design and data physicalization, give the opportunity for experimentation in the context where data was actually captured. However, our understanding of how this can be done based on people's needs is limited. To understand people's needs, we visited five households, and we used an object theater method to encourage our participants to imagine combinations of their meaningful objects and their personal data. The contribution of our work is twofold. First, we suggest a new method to investigate how people understand and reflect on data. And second, we introduce directions on how to design data objects from an experience-centering point of view. We have three main questions. What can we learn from people's current self-tracking practices in informing data objects? How can you, we encourage speculative combinations between everyday objects and data? And what are the implications for designing data objects for situated data representations? Here you can see some explorations of data objects from previous studies. 
Uh, the first picture on the left is a phone case that presents activity data of the person who owns it. In this case, the person can experience their data through touch. The second picture is the occupied table. In this example, you can see that the data is represented through the properties of the table. And in the last picture, you can see a guitar plectrum representing the heartbeat data of a bass player from the moment he was actually performing on stage. Gauche argued, objects are memory boxes. They drop within themselves individual memories and collective memories. These were the kinds of insights we were interested in in our study. Next, I will present to you the roots of our methodology. For our methodology, we drew from three major approaches that you can see here on this slide. We, be, we build on, on those approaches in different ways. First, we used people's meaningful artifacts as objects for object probes, which gave us insights into the people's social relationship with the personal objects. Second, to dig into the material and body-centric relationships of people to objects, we thought about, about our participants' personal data archive as, as wardrobes and their tracking devices as accessories. Last, in the transformative approach, we were inspired by object theater, uh, where the performer manipulates an object to tell a story for an audience, and by doing so, transforms from ordinary, ordinary relationships between people and objects. Actually, our participants became the performers in our case. Methodology. Now we'll move to our methodology. Uh, differently than previous studies on self-tracking and personal informatics, we have mainly used questionnaire surveys that have mainly used questionnaire surveys and qualitative interviews. We used object theater and followed the participatory design approach. We conducted six exploratory object interviews together with object theater exercises that lasted 60 to 90 minutes each. We asked people about their self-tracking practices and we created with them all the classes of their ordinary objects, such as, such as keys and sentimental artifacts, for example, gifts. Then, based on that, we asked our participants to envision that object, com object combinations. During the process, we asked them questions such as how would you register your data on X object? And then we invite them to show how they will interact with each object, object when connected to the data. In this picture, you can see one of our participants while showing two of the data object ideas. But how did we conduct our analysis? All the video data was transcribed. We collected in total 68 photographs of our participants' personal objects. Here, actually, you can see an example of those photographs with uh, uh, the pseudonyms, some of the pseudonyms we gave to our participants. The photos of the participants' personal objects together with the narratives around each object were used during the first stages of our analysis as media to organize and remember what were the objects and what people actually had said about them. Next, we looked into the data object ideas. Uh, initially, we had 30 data object combinations, but we excluded four because they were unrelated to self-tracking. You can actually see all of them in this picture. We conducted our analysis inspired by Gaver and Bowers annotated portfolios. We basically extracted the data objects from our transcripts and we followed a similar labeling process as if the ideas were physical prototypes. We clustered our ideas based on interaction styles, the type of data, and the motivation of the participants, which gave us seven themes. The themes were self, others, close to the body, away from the body, representation, tracking, and connectedness to the data. A synthesis of the themes gave us three main categories, three main categories of our findings, which are social sharing, contextual ambiguity, and interacting with the body. The first category reflect the social aspect around the use of data objects. 11 out of the 12 out of the 26 uh, ideas involve directly or indirectly another person in self-tracking. For example, one of our participants used the Strava app to track his cycling performance. And based on that, he imagined a Strava cup, which would show who is the fastest and who was elevating the most during cycling. Contextual ambiguity is our second category. And in this case, 13 out of the 26 data objects ideas were completely disconnected from the tracking activity, suggesting some form of ambiguity in the interaction with the potential data system. For example, one of our participants had a soft toy since he was a kid, and he imagined that to record his voice during sleep. Interacting with their body, with the body is, the, is our last category, and 
where 10 out of the 26 data objects were imagined di in direct contact with the body, while 17 out of the 26 data object ideas were both tracking devices and representations of data. The rest were tracking sort only, most often placed close to the body to ensure tracking is switched on. For example, one of our participants imagined that his king boots, as you saw in the picture previously, can start tracking his performance the moment he would pull the shoelaces. Some of those combinations that were both tracking device and representations of data showed that data objects were not in direct contact with the body. That objects that were not in direct contact with the body acted both as switches and representations. Now we'll conclude with our design considerations. Overall, what was very prominent in our study is the history of personal objects and how that influenced how people imagined and talked, and talked about the speculative combinations. Our research showed that it was easier for the participants to imagine that the objects that could both represent and track data when those objects were not worn on the body. From that, we speculate that it only makes sense for people to represent their data on their body if the data is also relevant to others. We suggest that, that data objects can function without direct coupling to the tracking activity and that ambiguous objects may open a space for reflective data experiences in everyday life. We propose that this ambiguity can be achieved by unexpected couplings of data and objects. In particular, we see an advantage in metaphors that relate to everyday objects and are rooted, in, um, and are rooted into people's cultures, as for example, a doll that will watch your sleep. Last, we believe that a turn towards self-exploration through tracking requires more playful systems that apart from motivating behavioral change may promote collaboration and experimentation with other people around us. The example actually of the interactive mug that I talked about previously illustrates that nicely. So this is everything, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. And by the way, I'm, I'm here today with my co-author so she will join for the questions too. All right, thanks so much. Let's give applause to, to the presentation. Um, thanks very much. Um, I wonder, could you uh, stop sharing the screen? Yes. Thanks. And everyone, please uh, post your questions on the chat. This is an exercise in tolerating silence. <laughs> <laughs> this digital conference. Uh, okay, maybe maybe I can open here. Um, thanks for the presentation. I I found the um, idea of data objects really interesting, but I um, I I also read the paper and I think I had a hard time understanding like what is the problem behind like. Uh, what, what, which motivates you to to uh, use this concept? I mean that, I mean that. What what in fact is the problem uh, with uh, data being unconnected from the context where it's produced? If I understand it co uh, correctly, so if people get self track and and then have this data on X end, so is the problem that they have a hard time understanding their their data, or 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 that they somehow uh, can, can what what's the problem with connecting with the data? I, uh, can you elaborate on that? I guess it's not exactly a problem. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I guess this was, of course this was not a pro like a typical problem gap paper, right? It was like an open exploration. We visited people's homes, and we wanted to find out how they would relate with their objects when they were connected with their data. And I guess uh, that's in line with this massive turn towards self-reflections and the, how unique people are. So yes, of course, there is no problem with having a tracker on your hand where, and you see your data on your phone, but actually there is also this self-experimentation and this do-it-yourself mentality that exists 
uh, during the last year, or it has come up during the last uh, years. So that's why we think there is space for this type of exploration. So, so we find links between people's personal, you know, between people's idiosyncrasies and things that could represent data around them. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, then uh, Sophie Sido has a question. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I think I link in there where you were just left off because it's um, that that was or it's a bit similar. It's uh, because I'm, for example, wearing like one of those trackers and maybe it's uh, not uh, aesthetically as pleasing or something which could be definitely a valuable value. But I was wondering in which way, like what are kind of like the enhanced value you see in these types of data objects, or so what could be like a, an additional level there? You, your your um, examples bring to that. Um, in yeah, you can also, or should I? You know? can start. I can also. I I guess. Um, so, I guess exactly because people are unique, we interact with with things differently. For instance, you might hold your pen in a different way than the way I hold my pen, right? And if we are, I think if we're moving towards a world where, where data is gonna be around us, then the way that, you know, it's, uh, it's more comfortable with us to interact with objects is important. So I think this is, this is sort of, you know, encapsulated into this idea of personal objects of using personal objects as devices that could show your data, because actually you might be able to choose how this is gonna be possible. You know, and this is closer to you, and perhaps it's more comfortable. And there is also some point poetry into it. I mean, I I've been using a tracker for many years too. This is not a tracker, but I was, and I went back to analog, exactly because this is more aesthetically pleasing to me than than my tracker. Um, I guess that's my my answer, more or less. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would compliment on that because I think also one of the things we found in, uh, during the study was that people do um, do make their own visualizations and they make the data appealing for themselves because they cannot do it with the existing systems or the data is presented in, in such a generalized forms that it doesn't give them the insights that they are looking after. So also if we could expand that thinking also in, in the way data is being captured, could there be more kind of like tailor-made um, systems or, or, or objects that you could actually use for, for tracking that data? And could that already enable some of the, some of the manipulation or some of the things that you want to do with that, uh, that data that you're capturing? Uh, and also, I would, I would add that another aspect was this kind of um, sharing of your, of your data. And, and we don't mean to share it online or, or share it you know, through, through the platforms necessarily but also how is data being discussed and um, shared among the people that you live with? Or like we had a roommate in, uh, in the study and we had a family, uh, like yeah, people who live with their families. So, so you somehow also want to and need to discuss your, your data that you're capturing if it's relevant for other people. And, and there were some aspects that were, were more relevant, for instance, uh, with the roommates when they were both um, exercising a lot, they would like to compare and, and kind of learn from each other in that. And compete. And compete also, yes, <laughs> in, a, in a kind of more game, gamified way. So those kind of aspects that the systems uh, maybe enable only in one way, but if you could actually have a shared object that you could uh, somehow use in, in the tracking activity or the data um, activity. Right, then Minna Sargeto, go on. Hi, uh, I think this kind of research settings are so fascinating. So I wanted to ask about recruiting the participants. Was it easy or hard? How did you find them in practice? And what kind of criteria did you apply in, in choosing the participants? Should I go ahead? So, mm. so yeah. So it was extremely, extremely challenging actually to find people exactly because like one reason was because we had to enter their homes and then we, we had to ask really 
to ask them to show us their, their favorite objects. And, you know, we live in a world that people are so busy that they don't really allow you to do that. But we try to recruit through an online forum, the My Data Forum in Finland, uh, through the university, through posters, uh, snowball sampling. Um, I think that was it. That was it, more mm. or less. And, and we used also social media to advertise our, our recruitment process. We had in total seven actually participants that came back to us. And we, one of them dropped out of the study before we even started the, we, before we visited actually their, their, their homes. Um, criteria. The criteria was that they, the first one was that they had some kind of experience with self-tracking before. And the second, Mm. Oh, that's like embarrassing, but I, I, I don't remember the second criteria. They had previous ex experience and then, um, yeah, the, there was a second one, I also remember. Anyways, that, I think that was the main thing, that they knew they had experience with tracking before and they used some kind of way to track their data, whether that was notes or, like, I mean, you know, in journals, uh, or they used digital means as a, such as Excel sheets and stuff like that. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I think we'll need to wrap up now. Thanks for the presentation. Let's give applause to Maria Garuda and Maria thanks. Ruppi and others. And thanks for the audience as well for the discussion. Uh, there's uh, in 15 minutes, there's the after work starting. Uh, don't forget that. You'll find the Zoom link in the program. And that will be hosted by Kia, I think. So that's going to be in the track one session. So I recommend you navigate over there for some entertainment directed by Kia Höck, who is known to be great at it, directing entertainment. So <laughs> <laughs> give it a go. It's going to be one more piece of experimentation with online, online gatherings. And then other than that, track three will pick up again tomorrow morning at 8.30 Central European time with a couple of more sessions waiting there. So we hope to see many of you tomorrow as well. Thanks so much for everybody who's joined today. Thank you.